Word of God for meditations from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, the second letter, where he writes these words, If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That is God's word. It was the French brilliant philosopher, mathematician, scientist, uh, Blaise Pascal, who said these words, only Christianity makes men happy and loving. <coughs> Only Christianity makes men happy and lovable. Pascal was a very perceptive person, and early in his life he saw what life without Christianity was. He ran with all the different kinds of people and different philosophies one could imagine. Lord blessed them with a photographic memory. He knew the whole scripture by heart. And the Holy Spirit brought it together for him. And he came to see Jesus Christ as his Savior. And God in flesh who died for him. And through that, he pulled it together and began to see life and reality in a brand new way. And so he makes many an observation like this that is in few words, covering a lot of ground. Again, only Christianity makes men happy and lovable. Now think about that. If that is true, then I believe it is. If only the good news of God's free forgiveness, gift of salvation, the wonderful record of Jesus' infinite love for us, if that alone makes men happy and lovable, that is something that we should think about. And Paul says the same thing here today. If anyone is in Christ, if anyone takes the time to learn everything from the Bible about Christ, allow the word of Christ to build them up, they are a new creation. The archaic, the old, has passed away. Behold, all things are new. Now, in our gospel reading today, there were many things that were happening in the story of the prodigal son and comes home. And the loving father, who is a picture of Christ, freely forgives him. But the older brother gets very angry and upset. And the implication at the end of the story is that the older brother will murder the father, as the scribes and Pharisees did Jesus. But in that gospel account of Jesus, you not only see the beautiful forgiveness of the Father, who is the Christ here, but you see the two extremes in life. And in many ways, we have these two extremes tearing apart our country, tearing apart the world, tearing apart people, and tearing apart families. The one extreme is legalism. All kinds of human rules and regulations invented by man to teach that man can be his own savior. And it always ends up in some oppressive Ponzi scheme where you have layers of people and not everybody is treated equally, not everyone is treated with dignity, but salvation by works brings so much misery psychologically uh, to the world. It's just all kinds of stupid rules and regulations that men manufacture to oppress people, or to be on top of people, or to control people. So you've got legalism uh, galore today. And then on the opposite extreme, you have lawlessness, uh, which would be a picture of the young man who told his father, drop dead, and that's what he had to do, drop dead, old man, I want my inheritance. Shockingly, the father gave it to the young man, and he went and he spent it, and soon was in poverty. And for a Jewish man, feeding pigs, not a good job, and wanting to eat the food of pigs, not a good desire. And finally, he begins to come to his senses. But it takes a lot of pain and travail for the young man to realize that lawlessness, doing your own thing, is no better than legalism, trying to think that you can be your own savior and concocting all kinds of rules and regulations that you think one must do to put themselves in a right relationship with God. And so often these rules and regulations that people manufacture are just things that are very harmful, very, very toxic, as opposed to God's very beautiful word of law and his wonderful word of gospel here. Paul here in this uh, beautiful letter says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Now that's a big challenge for us today because all of us are pulled in so many different directions. 
How do we find time to really be in this book, in the Bible, in Christ's Word? Every word that flows from this Word is from the breath of the Spirit, from the breath of Christ. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. And not only does God grant to us a sense of happiness, we might call it also joy, but He grants to us a sense of uh, contentment, He grants to us a sense of well-being, and a feeling that we are well-loved. And if you are well-loved, if you feel that, if you know that, then you can begin to become a bit more lovable. And if you are a bit more lovable, that's good for everybody around you, including yourself as well. Now, when Paul says something like this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a human creation, you wonder what the there is for. And earlier, Paul tells us what part of this new creation means. He said, Christ died for all. That's a beautiful gospel uh, facet. And it's so wonderful because if Jesus died for all, the implications are that he died for you and me. And if Jesus died for you and me, we know that our sins are forgiven. Also, if Jesus died for every single person who lived, beloved in Christ, that is the foundation for equality. That is the foundation for dignity. We don't treat people merely as human beings like the world would. In fact, the world treats them less than human beings. But if Jesus Christ, true God and true man, died for everybody, there are no ordinary people. Everybody is extraordinary. On that cross, on that skull, on Good Friday, Jesus poured out infinite love for every single person that would be conceived and born and lived in this world. And so in Christ, we look at things totally different. God so loved everybody. He died for all. And that is the foundation, not only for hope and love, but when we allow that love to sink in, we become a bit more lovable. We become a bit more kind. We become a bit more forgiving, more gracious. Isn't that the stuff that the world really needs? Paul, when he wrote to the Christians at Galatia, he said, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, that is the fruit that comes forth when people take a good, deep, long look at Jesus Christ and His infinite love for all mankind. The fruit of that Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control, more lovableness, more happiness. Seek ye first the gift of God's kingdom and everything else that you need in life, God will add unto you happiness and joy through Jesus Christ. Now Paul writes that, which is really kind of interesting because at one time Paul had been a miserable man. He had been a hater of humanity. In Acts chapter 9, Luke, who became one of his good friends, talks about what Paul was like before he became a Christian and it wasn't happy or lovable. Before Paul became a Christian, this is what Luke records in Acts chapter 9. His name was Saul. And Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the Lord's disciple, disciples, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus in order to bring any of the followers of Jesus he might find there, men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. On his way, as he was to Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Paul fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And he suddenly realized he was in the presence of the risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ. And he suddenly realized that this Jesus was Lord, ruler over all things, including death. And he not only realized that Jesus was ruler over all things, but he began to start to see a cosmic picture of Jesus Christ. 
And then a terrific insight here that I think we overlook so easy, all of us. Jesus said to Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? Now think about that. Anytime we say something that is hurtful or harmful to any other fellow believer, who do we hurt? Not only a person, but Christ. Anytime we say anything toxic or put down someone or drive them away from Christ by how we behave or what we say, we persecute Christ. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus feels the pain of every single believer, and we ask why. Well, we've been baptized into his body, and therefore, if we feel pain, Christ feels pain. Now, we have to make a very careful distinction here. Jesus died on the cross once for all, for all the sins of the world. That's no more suffering for that. But when you or I suffer, Christ is not only sympathetic to it, he is empathetic to it. Why, he dwells within us, as well as dying for us. So Paul here speaks of, uh, you know, why we are new creations. We got a whole new outlook on things because we know that Jesus Christ, true God and full man, also died for all people, rose for you and for me. And Paul says, God was in Christ reconciling the whole cosmos, all the billions of people that rebelled and went a different way. Christ was suffering on the cross for every single one of them. God was in Christ and he's reconciled the whole world unto himself and he no longer counts the sins of mankind against us. Our sins were all forgiven 2,000 years ago. When Christ cried out on the cross, paid in full every single sinner who ever lived, every single sin that would ever be committed, Christ paid for it, died for it. His blood washed away. It was a cosmic death. So the whole world has been declared not guilty, forgiven. And we are called to be ambassadors as new creations and tell people, God has washed away all your sins. Receive this good news. Be a friend of him who is the friend of sinners, Jesus Christ, who died for you. And then when people begin to start studying the details of that story, they're not only going to find more hope and joy and peace, but happiness and become more lovable. Now, it's always a work in progress. <coughs> But that is how God works, through his word of pardon, through the details of the story of Jesus Christ. He makes new creations, wonderful people, and big changes if we allow him, if we are willing to listen to his word and see how much he loves us. And we think of not only the big changes like Saul going to Paul, God takes the greatest enemy against the church, a terrorist a fanatic, a person that was murdering Christians, turns them around and turns them into the greatest ambassador to the Gentiles, the author of 13 of the 27 books, the man who would then write the love chapter of the Bible, from hater of humanity to love chapter. You think of one of the songs that we love, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That was written by John Newton. And John Newton had been a slave owner, and he would take slaves from one place to another in the ship that he captained. And then he went through several crises. And the gospel, the message of Christ's love, crucified and risen, came to him and arrested him. And he began to see uh, all of reality from a different perspective that he was loved by the Son of God, and that every single person mattered in life. And in time, he would move away from that slavery. And then he would influence the most uh, influential person in terms of the abolition of slavery in England, William Wilberforce. And you just saw how the love of Christ made such a huge difference. 
not only in freeing slaves, but in people beginning to treat children like people, and people beginning to treat other human beings as the object of Christ's love, and not just some uh, distant uh, evolution from some monkey or ape. There's such a drastic difference. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Uh, Jesus frees us uh, to love. The old has passed away there. So as we think about this, uh, we see there is such a practical benefit of finding time to allow God to speak to us daily in His Word, that we become more convinced of His love, that we become, by His grace, more lovable, and that that new creation grows. Because here's the best thing we can do for our world. The best thing we can do for our world is proclaim the gospel, truly be ambassadors for Christ, and grow in the knowledge of Christ's love for us, and become more lovable, become more happy, if you will. And if we are more joyful, and if we are by God's grace more lovable, and the gospel is proclaimed, the most beautiful things on the face of the earth occur. But we have to do our part by allowing Jesus to fill us more deeply with his love that we grow in grace and truly become magnets for Christ. As a child, I always felt loved um, internally, not externally. Uh, there, uh, we went through beings and we went through uh, hellish experiences, but the simple, profound message of Christ dying for us and rising for us and dwelling for us gave us a sense of well-being. And we were happy kids uh, despite everything going on around us. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That's the message today. And when we allow God through His Word to allow us to grow in the knowledge of this love, we become more lovable. We become more happy, we become more certain, and we become more kind, and more good, and more faithful to our word, never as a way to earn our way to heaven, but simply as part of God's blessings to us. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ, and all of us may grow to be more lovable, more joyful with a deeper sense of peace. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding may guard and keep your hearts and minds in the only Savior of sinners, Jesus Christ, who has made us a new creation. Amen.